Um, so today, the uh, lecture, the title of the lecture is about eigenvalues and eigenstates of angular momentum. But let me give you a little bit of context, what we're going to be talking about. So we talked about the rotations, right? Uh, with the rotation group with SO3. Then we said uh, the quantum, quantum mechanics, uh, we had these particles that we modeled uh, with uh, two-dimensional vectors, complex vectors, with two-dimensional complex vectors and over space. And we needed a representation of rotations on this two-dimensional vector space. Um, so these were two by two unitary uh, matrices uh, with determinant one, right? SU2. Today, what we're going to be talking about is what is a spin J particle, how it transforms under rotations. But along the way, I'll try to comment and tell you, you could take a step further back and understand and think deeply about what a particle is. So we're, what, what happens today, you could just follow the map and think about it, you know, like just try to figure out what the representations are. But something really profound happened when this theory of angular momentum or uh, representations was developed. There was a rethinking or a deeper understanding of the, what a particle is um, that emerged out of this picture. All right. Um, so, Let's start with a, with a review of the last lecture as uh, we go along, if there are any questions, ask. We talked about rotations around, uh, so if, sorry, if you have a rotate, uh, in, in three dimensions, you could label rotations by picking a vector n hat that is kept fixed under rotation. And then you describe the rotation by rotation around this vector by angle uh, five. We use the notation of R n hat five, for example. I, at different places, I different use different notations, but this is one notation we use, right? Then we said that uh, this rotation must act on a, uh, the spin half particle, that this two dimensional uh, Hilbert space, and the way it acts is using a representation. So it's this d of R of n and hat phi, this is the rotation operation, and this is the representation of it, how it acts on the Hilbert space. And uh, the way it acts, we, we described it, is e to the power of minus i s um, dot n hat, the, the uh, phi over h bar, and then we said, we said that in the case of a spin half particle, all we need are basically the Pauli matrices normalize this way, right? So um, these are where the Pauli matrices are. The anti commutators are this. This is just like, these are simple identities that follow from these definitions. Good, any questions? Of course, a rotation has three parameters and uh, this representation should always have three parameters. So we'll discuss that in more detail today. Um, yeah, so here, here's what the rep, uh, representation of a rotation around n hat by angle phi in the two-dimensional Hilbert space is. So you just expand it explicitly and you find these expressions, right? This is what we did last time. So if the uh, vector n hat has n x, n y, and n z components, this is what they look like. The, ver the very fact that this is a normalized vector, it tells you that only two of them are right? So nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared has to be one. So those are two variables and then phi is the third variable, right? So these are what the matrices are. We said that there's something really profound here by the virtue of the fact that this is phi over two. So I, I pointed out that this phi over two is very important. Um, let me, let me think if I can make a comment here. All right, okay, no, <laughs> I'm not gonna make a comment. Then, uh, all right, so those are what the rotation matrices are. 
Uh, now, if you uh, calculate expectation value, so you, you take a ket, you apply rotation to it, you look at the expectation value of uh, uh, spin operators, Sx, Sy, Sz, before and after, and the expectation values are real variables. They transform exactly as you would expect by real SO3 matrices, right? Three by three rotation matrices. However, this, this is the story of expectation values. However, crucially, because of this factor of half, the kits act, the action of the kit is a little bit more complicated. If you rotate around your favorite uh, vector by two pi, you should come back to identity Whereas this uh, transformation in the Hilbert space does not come back to identity, it picks up a sign. Now, uh, there, there will be a sign from, so this expectation value is a kit and a bra. There will be a sign from the kit and there's a sign from the bra and then they will cancel. That is why you don't see that in the expectation values. However, the sign is, is there and this is the origin of um, the idea of a spinner, right? The spinner, uh, we said that um, if you swap, if you swap the operators, uh, sorry, the spinner was, so first of all, spin, spin half particle is basically an object like this. Uh, a half integer spin picks up a minus one as we go around by two pi. I'll we'll describe this in more detail. But you also commented on how this is related to statistics, right? You said that if you have two spin half particles, to swap the two, you will have to apply a rotation by pi, right? For both of them. Now, just plug in rotation for pi here. You're going to pick an i. So two i's will give you a minus one. That is the connection between spin and statistics, at least at the level of this course. All right? Then we said that these rotation by two pi's uh, that act non trivially in the Hilbert space, giving you a minus sign um, over the, uh, an overall minus sign on the ket, actually are experimentally observable. And uh, we, we talked about interferometry, right? This was just a simple setup. Uh, the way we, we made the measurement was that we sent two particles along this path and along this path, sorry, not two particles, like a beam that is split into two parts, right? Along this path and this path. And then uh, this path was exposed to magnetic field for some distance uh, L, right? So if the particle is moving, say with some constant speed C or speed of light, whatever, right? So C over L is the amount of time the particle is exposed to this magnetic field that we're going to assume to be uniform. Because of this exposure, it will start rotating, right? And uh, interestingly, um, well, okay, so it will, it will pick up a phase rotation described by, these, uh, by the action of these unitaries. And as you bring the two beams back and interfere them, you notice that uh, the two peaks, the separation between two peaks corresponds to by rotation by four pi and not two pi, right? So you see constructive versus destructive interfere. So this is the way that you test the uh, uh, two pi. Any questions? All right. Uh, SO3 and SU2 are both groups. SO3, sorry, SU2 is a double cover of SO3, right? It's basically, as we just described, uh, if you want to think about SU2, it's, it's like going around by two pi, by rotation matrices, but instead of coming back where you started, you go around again by two pi and you end up uh, back again. So SO3 is a, S is for special, means determinant one. O for orthogonal, right? Orthogonal means R, R transpose, R transpose, R equal identity and real, right? Orthogonal also means real. 
And then three means three by three matrices, right? So let me add the word real here. But these are real. And these are complex. SU2 is unitary matrices. They are unimodular determinant one, and they're two by two complex. Yeah, they both have three degrees of freedom. One of them is a double couple. We'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll work it out a little bit more today. All right, so this is a summary of what we went through last time. Any questions? Is the double cover relationship true for all higher dimensional rotations in real space versus... Uh, okay. <laughs> um, in your question is a quantum field theory question. In uh, three dimensions and above, you always end up with uh, double covers. We're not talking SU2 anymore, but we're talking about uh, different rotations. You always end up with double covers. In two plus one, you end up with um, Z, the cover is Z, right? The uh, group of integers, so two plus one is different, and that is the origin of anions. But I think that is the, the answer to your question. I'm happy to discuss more, but it's above uh, the level of this course. Good. By the way, ju just because you asked, uh, what are what is the group rotation group uh, for vectors, two-dimensional vectors, right? So if I have a 2D vector, real vector, right? X and Y, how, how do you describe rotations? So that's something that you recognize. These are real rotations. This group has a name. Tell me what the group, the name of the group is. They form a group. SO2, exactly. Special orthogonal two by two matrices. Orthogonal because it's uh, real and it satisfies a property that of this time this transpose is identity. Special because determinant one, determinant is cosine squared plus sine squared, that's one. It's SO2. Good. So as you can see, there's only one variable, and the variable runs from zero to two pi. So I can think of this as a circle. It's pretty straightforward, right? You take a two-dimensional uh, space, you pick a point under this rotation, you go around the origin and come back here by two pi. So it's just trace the part. The point traces a circle, right? Now, this is the story of two two space dimensions. Now, if you try to do something similar to what we we're doing, uh, you end up with an infinite cover of this Z cover of it. So, yeah, uh, it would be group U1. No, sorry, off. <laughs> sorry, the group on. Anyway, but that's, that's, that's above this course. That's the that's, that's thing that describes anions. Any questions before we start uh, today's session? There are two things that we're going to focus on. Um, there are two things that we're going to describe today. Uh, two crucial things. First, we're going to talk about how the story generalizes to spin J particles. Okay? And we're going to do, say what are the requirements, how the rotations act on some particle that's spin J. But as I said earlier, you could take your step further back and as more zoomed out point of view will tell you what the hell is spin and what the hell is a part. So this this is this this analysis is actually pretty profound and it, it really Wigner started this and it left a very deep uh, it, it really changed the way that we we view physics. All right. So let's start somewhere simple. Let's start with Euler rotations. What are or what is what is a, what are Euler rotations? It's just a particular way of achieving a rotation in R three. So, 
how do I rotate something in R3? Well, it's pretty easy. An arbitrary rotation, let's say I want to rotate this table. First, I pick a, which one did I pick first? Z hat. I pick a Z hat and rotate around Z hat by angle alpha. That's like this rotation. Now, after I do this, I would like to rotate around the another axis, right? Y. But my first rotation changed what Y was, right? If I start with X, Y, Z, under a rotation under Z, Y goes to Y prime. So it's natural to pick Y prime and rotate by angle beta. Then, oh, 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 sorry. Uh, No, that's, that's good. Okay. Then the third thing I want to do is I want to pick a third direction and rotate, right? Now I have a new Z prime. Here I could have also picked X prime. These, these angles are arbitrary. You pick that and you rotate it. Good. This is a general rotation, the most general rotation. You rotate first. Then pick a new angle, you pick a new vector in the perpendicular direction, rotate, pick another vector in the perpendicular direction, rotate. Is that good? Now, this is not the most convenient way of writing things down because the axis, whoops, these axes depend on alphas, right? If I rotate around Z by angle alpha, where my new y prime is depends on alpha. That's just not convenient. Euler angles are a repackaging of this formula in terms of an arbitrary rotation, in terms of rotations with fixed basis, x, y, without touching. Right? That's, that's what the idea is. And we're going to do that very quickly. It's pretty straightforward. You might have seen it. You probably have seen the class couple of times before. So what is r, y prime beta? It's rotation around y prime by angle beta. How do you how do you uh, find this rotation? Well, y prime is actually is y rotated by this these this matrix. So if you want to do rotation around y prime by angle beta, you first rotate by you. You first undo this rotation. You first undo this rotation. Rotate around Y. Rotate back. That's basically all that is. That, is, that, is that intuitive? So if I want to do a rotation around this, this angle, this vector, and I want to relate, so this, this is the rotation around this vector I want to do. And then this vector I found by some other rotation. Well, let me, let me, let's say, okay. Uh, there, there's a vector y here, okay? And then there is a, I, the, the first rotation will rotate y to y prime, right? If I want to describe some rotation around y prime, what I'm going to do is, is the following. First, I'm going to, um, uh, how do I describe this? Um, oh, very good. So first, I'm going to rotate back here, do a rotation here, and bring it back. That's what I'm going to do. If you view this actively, it might be confusing. If you view it passively, it's given. That's that's where the passive picture, because passively is just a relabeling of uh, relabeling of vectors. Similarly, for z prime, you could do the same thing for z prime. So to get the Euler angle expression or Euler rotations, all you need to do is just to plug this in here and this in here. That's all you need to do. 
So that's what I've done. But then you notice that you still have Y primes, but those Y primes you can further simplify that you will do in a homework problem. After uh, one last identity that is also pretty logical, you obtain this relation. So what does it say? The punchline is this. <laughs> Euler angles describe an arbitrary rotation in the following sense, in the following way. It's sort of like a, an arbitrary rotation is you're breaking it down into three operations. The first one is pick Z and rotate by angle gamma. Then, so sorry, at the beginning, pick Z, X, Y. You, you, you pick at the beginning and don't change them. First, pick Z, rotate by angle gamma, then rotate around Y by angle beta, and that third operation is again rotation around Z by angle alpha. This is an arbitrary rotation. I have encouraged you to do this. And I'll try to remember to make you go through this. It's not that complicated. You just have to develop the intuition about rotations. That, that's all that is. So it's called oil, Euler angles, right? An arbitrary rotation is broken down in terms of rotation around, in, in the language of X, Y, Z. Rotations around fixed uh, factors. Is that good? It's a decomposition, yeah. Oh, it doesn't have, it's conventional, it's conventional. You could, have, you could have said x, y, x. You could have said, you know, uh, x, z, x. But you got to pick a convention, and that's the, the standard convention that people use. That's called Euler angles. The point, actually, the, the, this, this z, y, z might not be the most standard convention. Actually, it doesn't really matter because it's a real label in the, uh, what you call Z and X and Y. But what matters the most is Euler angles describes rotations in terms of axes that are not rotating themselves. They're predetermined, right? Z, X, and Y, you fix them, you rotate around those guys, right? In the first description, I was doing a rotation, then rotating around the new axis. Good? All right, you'll, you'll work this through this uh, in simple examples. There's nothing really profound. Um, now, this is a fact about rotations in three-dimensional space. By the virtue of the fact that represent, we have to represent these rotations on the Hilbert space using these V of R's, these unitary matrices, these unitary matrices must also decompose this way. So there is an analogous statement for these rotations acting on the Hilbert space. Right, so an arbitrary rotation could be this what with alpha, beta, and gamma could be described this way. There's something very convenient about this notation is that like you get rid of x, but yeah, you will see how that's convenient in quantum mechanics. All right, any questions about this? Actually, let's be a little bit more explicit. So what is dz of gamma? It's exponential of minus i gamma uh, sigma 3 poly z gamma over 2. What is this guy? It's e to minus i sigma y beta over 2. Now, if you just expand this, you find this rotation matrix. Interestingly, with a one over twos, this one over twos are the indication that here you go right, have to go around by four pi to come back, as opposed to two pi. And then this one also similarly is this e to minus i alpha two e to power i alpha two. So these three multiply them, you get a general SU two matrix parameterized by three labels that are 
the significance of which is Euler angles, right? So we're describing an arbitrary SU2 matrix using Euler angles. Is that good? Here is one line of notation that is important. I remember when I was learning quantum mechanics, up to here I was okay, but this notation, I always would just kind of skip it or not really care much about it. It is a little bit maybe at first ugly looking or maybe weird, but it really, really, really simplifies your life. <laughs> I cannot stress this enough. So what are we gonna do? This is the representation of a rotation by these Euler angles on the Hilbert space of a spin half particle. Okay, so here's D for D, half for spin half. And M prime and M are gonna be, so we're talking about two dimensional vectors, right? So I'm gonna complex vectors. So this is going to be, uh, how do I wanna call it? I think, yeah, this is half. And then this is minus half. I'm going to call these guys. M takes two values. Yeah. Uh, is there a specific reason why you're choosing like, the convention? Convention. It's, very, it's convention. Um, uh, it's, like, it's, it's the same sort of question that, you know, for, for, the, for the reason that sigma z or sigma 3 is diagonal. Why you're asking me why is this guy diagonal and one not the other one? Somebody fixed this notation and we want to work with the diagonal one because that's easier. So we always do Z. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you could have done Z, X, Z. It wouldn't have been much more complicated. But what you want is two Zs. You want two diagonal ones. Okay. That's, that that's your your questions. Okay. But this is all like dependent, depends on your notation. Great question. Any other questions? So what am I doing? I'm introducing this weird looking notation. Let me explain this weird looking notation. It might seem super redundant. I have a ket alpha, which is C plus C minus. And so far, we've talked about how you could write it uh, this way. Did I use this notation? I did. Okay. Let me let me just not confuse you guys and just. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, forgot what I was gonna say. Ah, these are two-dimensional vectors, complex vectors. They have to do with spin half. So let me write here the half. So this is half so that I later on generalize to a higher spin. I'm going to denote spin by some parameter j. So these are j equal halves. And then m is a variable that points out m is half here and minus half. Right? So I have a parameter j, which is half, and my m takes values from minus j to j, minus half and half. Good. So I'm going to write this as sum over m of a cm, right? Where c of half is c plus, and c of minus half is c minus. Right? It's just a rewrite. Good. Why am I doing this? In anticipation of writing a notation that generalizes to higher dimensions. We're going to see the following. That when you are talking about the spin one particle, the vectors are going to be three-dimensional. So they will be, uh, let me label them this way. Uh, 
right? There will be three, you, I'm not sure if you see here. So there will be three dimensional. M, so this is spin one. So this is J equal one, right? M runs from J to minus J shifted by integer. So this is M equal one, and this is M equal zero, this is M equal minus one, right? I'm still gonna write sum over M, CM, M. And this is understood that the range of M is minus J, minus J plus one, da, 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 J minus one, J. So you can totally see, this means that your Hilbert space is two J plus one dimensional. That's the range of that. What's gonna happen is the following. We're gonna, a spin J particle is going to be described by a two J plus one dimensional vector, complex vector, Hilbert space. And we're gonna derive that, but I'm just setting the notation in advance, right? So this means that I'm talking about a particular, uh, this is spin half, so two, there are two vectors. I'm looking at either up or down, similar here, up or down. So M and M prime are telling you about up or down. This is the half, and these are the Euler angles. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a good reason for that. That's a typo. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so then you should expect that by the end of this lecture, we will write an expression of this form. Actually, uh, by the end of this lecture, we'll literally write down this. We'll write B of J, M, M prime of alpha, beta, gamma, right? This describes the action of rotation but Euler angles alpha, beta, gamma, on a spin J particle in different components, right? As J, M, those matrices, J, M prime. Good. That's going to be, or sorry, the other way around. I think my, no, that's good. My notation is correct. I just swap what I'm but. All right. The rest of the lecture is about higher spin, but there something important happens. I'll, I'll, I'll try to make a point. It's, I've actually never explained this without using fancier math. So I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. We'll see how it works. So what are we going to do? We're going to first imagine that we don't know <laughs> what spin is. We don't know any of these notions. Spin half, we actually probably, got, probably don't know fundamentally what spin is. What we are thinking of is that we have a rotation in uh, a three dimensional rotation, R of x around uh, x hat with angle phi, and we have a representation of this on some Hilbert space. Okay? So these V of R's are some matrices. That satisfy those relations. That's all that it is. it's a representation. We define what a representation is, right? You guys remember? Then we're going to derive the fact that this relation holds. We're going to derive all of this. So, all along, I won't have time to do justice to this, but have in mind an analogy with ANA daggers. When we quantize a simple harmonic oscillator, what's, what happened is actually almost word by word. Well, it's very close. I'll comment on it at some point, but just keep that in mind. All right. Very good. So here are our rotation matrix, uh, the representation of our rotations. We said that what we do is we take these matrices and 
first consider the generator of them. So this is these Ji's are the generators of an infinitesimal rotation. This was our first step, right? Every time we had a transformation, whether it was translation in time, the generator was Hamiltonian. It was translation in space. The generator was uh, uh, angular momentum. Uh, sorry, it was momentum, right? And then we said that by the fact that these guys should satisfy uh, rotation, uh, uh, They should have the same commutation as rotations. This is the algebra of the generators. J i j j is i epsilon i j k j k. This is for an arbitrary spin. We don't even know a priori what these guys are, and we're going to derive it. We're going to what what Eugene Wigner did, or whoever I think it was Wigner. He started this with this basic construction, and he derived the whole thing. Although mathematically, this was all known. Just a Interpretation of quantum mechanics and this was not clear. All right. So let's first make a bunch of observations. All we're gonna do is we're gonna rely on these these relations. First, you notice that if you take jx squared plus jy squared plus jz squared, call that matrix j squared, this commutes with all three of them. It's a line of algebra, but it's a fact. It has to do with the fact that this is an epsilon IJK. It's totally anti-symmetric. All right, so we found an operator that commutes with all. So let's pick J squared and JZ, for example. And because they, they are commuting, they could be simultaneously diagonalized. So I'm going to pick a basis, ket AB, as the basis that simultaneously diagonalizes them, right? J squared acting on this is A, and J is actually in matching my notation over there. Let me put semicolons here. JZ acting on this is B. So this guy is the eigenvalue of JZ, and this guy is the eigenvalue of J squared. They simultaneously that. This is the best I can do. I cannot, so next to J squared and JZ, there is no other operator I can write down that is also commuting with both of them. Already you see a key intuition. Every time you want to represent some algebra, you first pick the largest commutative sub algebra. Pick the largest set of generators that simultaneously commute, because that those are going to be easy to deal with. Then you take simultaneous uh, eigenvalues. The goal is to find A and B. Is that good? Are there any questions? There will be a couple of lines of algebra, so yeah. Oh, this is JX, JY, JZ, or I can sometimes call them J1, J2, J3. Three dimensional space rotations. Those are the generators. Those are the gener lab yeah, labels of the generators. J's are the generators. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These XYZs, uh, sorry, I just keep switching from IJ for I and XYZ. Uh, yeah, I should probably stick to one notation, but yeah. It's just this one gets annoying. <laughs> Otherwise, all right. Yeah. Yes, I did. Thank you. Do you know why I missed that? Uh, sorry, is that that is it down here? It's down here. Sorry, right? Uh, the the reason is that sigma i sigma j's satisfy this without an h bar, right? And now EJ is sigma over H bar. So this H bar is up here, actually. That is correct. So here we go. 
That is correct, but you end up with an H bar there. Let me let me do it. So indeed, this is H bar, this is H bar, this is H bar. Multiply by H bar squared. You get the equation I have. Right? Fine. All right. The trick is to define ladder operators. What are ladder operators? They are J plus J minus, which is JX plus IJY plus minus. Why do we define these? Because when you define it this way, you first notice that JZ and J plus minus satisfy this relation. Of course, J plus minus commute with J squared and J plus and J minus give you two H bar JZ. All right, let's start at this. Does this look, does this look familiar? Can you see the, some connections, some connections, there are some differences as well between the, this and what we did in the simple harmonic oscillator. In the simple harmonic oscillator, we had the fields X and P. We had the operator X and P. Right? We had the operator X and P, and we had this commutation relation, I. Sorry. We defined these A's, which were up to omega factors of frequency, where X plus something IP, right? And this became a lowering operator, and the diagram became a raising operator. What was special about this was that we also had a, a number operator, Hamilton, up to a, a number operator was a relative Hamiltonian, right? And they satisfy well, relations similar to that. So J minus, let me copy it. So if you think of N as the analog of JZ, then L plus is the analog of A dagger and L minus is the analog of A. You will see that in a second. But there's one, one main distinction, which is the commutator of J plus J minus here is JZ, whereas the commutator of A and A dagger is one. Can you, can you tell me why we define ladder operators? What's the idea of ladder operators? I mean, the name is sort of should describe it. Yeah. You have to generate the next state just going a baseline or to be able to find the baseline. If you start with an, exact, if you start with an eigenket, J plus acting on it or J minus acting on it gives you a new eigenket. This is the idea, right? How do you show that? Well, take J plus minus acting on AB. Of course, the index A goes for the right, right? Because all of these guys can't change A. If we act with JZ on this, you can write this as the commutator plus J plus JZ. This commutator is going to be JZ. Uh, H bar, right? Plus minus H bar J Z. That plus minus H bar is here, and then I, I this guy is an I uh, becomes an eigenvector and you end up with this. So what happened was this: initially, you start with a vector that satisfies this relation, satisfied uh, B A B. This was your eigenket. You acted with J plus and J minus, you found a new eigenket with larger or smaller piece. That's why it's called a raising or a lowering operator. Or creation annihilation. Well, we don't call them creation annihilation here. Is that good? 
here's an analogy, as I said before. So if you remember from the simple harmonic oscillator, N A dagger was A dagger. That looks like J Z and J plus is H bar J Z. Oh. This is incorrect. Yeah, this is incorrect. H plus minus. Sorry about that. Is J plus and uh, J Z and J minus is minus J minus, so it's minus A. However, the commutator of these two guys is a little bit different. All right, so this in summary, when you act with J plus minus on ket A, B, what you get is ket A, B plus minus H bar up to a constant that we're going to calculate. Are there any questions here? All right, so now what we're gonna do is calculate A and B and these coefficients. So by acting on the eigenkets A and B, J plus keeps raising B. But we're gonna prove it cannot do this indefinitely. In fact, there's a condition. A has to be always, B squared has to be always less equal to B, A. All right, how do you find that condition? Well, let's look at J squared minus J Z squared. That is J X squared plus J Y squared. You could repackage it this way. This is a positive operator. Is it clear why it's a positive operator? Do you recall what a positive operator was? Huh? Yeah, so it has, there, there are many ways of saying it. One way of saying it is that it's a Hermitian operator with only positive eigenvalues. Another way of saying it is that it could be always written as something dagger something. Or another way of saying it is that all the diagonal matrix elements are positive. Okay. Now, why is this operator positive? Well, I actually wrote it in the second line. Right? That, that, that operator is Q, J plus dagger J plus. That is positive. And then J plus dagger, but the, other, the other combination, that's also positive. Is it clear that if you add two positive operators like this, you get positive operators? It shouldn't be. It's not always true. In this case, it is. But Actually, sorry, wait a second. This is always true. This is always true. By this relation, actually. By, by the ratio of the fact that it's an operator, if you calculate this, this is A psi plus psi, positive is positive, is also positive. Yeah, it's always true. All right, so this is a positive operator. Which means that all these matrix elements are not negative. If G Z keeps raising B, at some point this must become negative. That means that there must exist a J plus for which, and some there, there should be there exist must exist a B max for which this is this vanishes. Is that clear? So J plus 
there must exist a B max that is killed by J plus. If J plus kills that vector, you can act further on it with J minus, that's still zero. You repackage this, you rewrite J minus J plus as J squared minus J Z squared minus H bar J Z. This is just, again, uh, the commutation relations. Now, what is this? This is an eigenkit of this operator. So the eigenvalue must be zero. J squared acting on this gives you A. J Z squared acting on this gives you B max squared minus H bar J Z acting on gives you minus B max H bar. This must be zero, all right? From which you find that B max satisfies this relation with A. That's why we kept track of A. Are there any questions so far? Let me make it less painful and just do something quick on the board right now. So we found that A is B max, B max plus H bar. Okay. Um, do I want to actually? Yeah. Let's divide this side. Bar h bar squared. Let, let's let's divide this side, both sides by h bar squared. So I'm gonna get b max. Yeah, b max over h bar. B max over h bar plus one. Right. This is that parameter m. We're talking. That integer we're talking about. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. That will be changing variables that will come in a bit. Yeah. For every value A, uh, there is a different B max value, indeed. A will set the spin of the particle. A, say for spin J, B max value is the range of M. M max, right? That that we said that M can go from minus J to J. This is, we're just deriving that loop. Similarly, there is a, uh, there must exist a B min. By the, by basically identical argument. There must exist a B min because uh, J zero, uh, that, that's kill, the, whose eigenkit is killed with J minus. From which, by repeating that argument, by repeating an analogous, the, the same argument, you get A must be B min times B min minus H bar, all right? So these are two relations we find. From this, you first deduce that B max has to be minus B min, and B max has to be positive. So B, goes from minus B max to B max. And B max is B min plus some integer, positive integer times H bar, which tells you that B max is some positive integer times H bar over two. I missed the factor of two over there, but. All right. No, actually, I think not. That's okay. All right. So you define B to be M H bar. Your B max over H bar, you call it J. Then your A squared becomes H bar squared J, J plus one. And M ranges from minus J to J. That's it. What happened here? What physics did we discover? 
what 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 came out of this? Huh? Uh, not not yet, not yet. No, this is no. But something interesting happened. I start with a bunch of relations of some abstract operator J Z J X J Y, right? Then I found that up to h bar, there are integers. M runs from minus j, minus j, minus one. We found that whatever this property is, called spin, called angular momentum, is quantized. It cannot take any values in here. We discovered the quantization of angular momentum. And at the same time, we discovered the existence of half, well, sorry, the existence of spinner, basically. The simple argument, or maybe it was, it was 10 a.m. on a uh, Thursday, so you didn't follow every step of it, but it's very simple linear uh, uh, argument. You discovered that the value, allowed values must be discrete and quantized, which means that you're gonna end up with finite dimensional holders. So put j equal half. j has to be half integer. We discovered that, right? Every time it's half integer, it's not a whole number. It's half, three halves, five, five, five over two. We call it a spinner. Every time it's integer, it's, no, it's not a spinner. That half is when you go around and you pick up a minus sign. When it's half, it's not whole integer. When it's whole integer, you go around by two pi and there's no minus sign. So what are all the possibilities? You start with it's n over two, right? And set it n equal zero. What do you get? J is zero, right? It means what? It means that the particle rotations don't act on the particle. We call such particles scalar. You haven't seen any such particles in quantum mechanics yet, but they exist in nature. Higgs particles are scalar. Take it to be one, n to be one, so that your spin is half. That's a qubit. That's what we always talk about, right? The Hilbert space is two dimensional. What's the dimensionality of the Hilbert space? The range of this, 2j, 2J plus 1. So when j is 0, what's the dimensionality of the Hilbert space? It's 1. It means that you only have one state because the phase is irrelevant. There's no physics associated with this. When j is half, you get a qubit. When j is 1, you get a three-dimensional vector space. Right? That's a spin 1 part. What is the next spinner after a qubit? What's the dimensionality of the Hilbert space? <laughs> so j equal half was two, j equal one was three. So the next one is three halves. J equals three halves, you get four, dimension four, right? <laughs> no, okay, it's not that complicated. Uh, all right, what is complicated is 10 a.m. Yeah, that's <laughs> all right. So, in summary, we just let go of a and b and we use j and m to label our cats, right? So, there is an operator called j squared, it's called total angular momentum. Whose eigenvalues are this j times j plus one h bar and j. Under rotation, all rotations commute with j squared. This is okay. So, sorry, this is important. I, I should emphasize going forward. Oh, I, I'm really behind, but it's okay. 
this is very important. All rotations cannot change the value of j because they all can move the j squared. Good. That's why we talk about the spin half particle. That's why spin is the property of a particle. Does that make sense? Think about what would have gone wrong if J was not preserved under rotation. What would have happened? You would, you would start with a particle and say the spin is half. You apply a rotation and the spin changes. That's nonsensical. That's not the property of the particle because the rotation could be passive. It could be my head. It could be change of my relabeling my coordinates. The spin is a property of the particle because of the very fact that uh, it's invariant. Right? Rotations can't do anything to it. Similarly, yeah, okay, is that, is that, is that good? So you, we're gonna try to abstract out a notion. The kits that describe the particle, let's say you have a particle kit JM. What the, the particle, what do you call a particle? A particle is not a particular JM, it's a two dimensional vector space. A spin half particle is not a particular kit, but it's a two dimensional vector space. Because if you start with this a spinner in this state and apply a rotation to it, if you ask you how many particles do you have, you still have you say, I still have one particle, right? This is my particle. I just rotated it, right? Is that good? I, I know it, the stuff at the moment might sound like weird, but it's pretty deep in a bit, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Is the J C how you're rotating it? So how do you rotate? At an exponential of minus i j z over h bar phi does what? Rotation around axis z by angle phi. Right? This does rotation around axis x by phi. So how is that changed? Oh, sorry. What, what, is, what is the question? For the bottom line, you have JC. Ah, ah, very good. Uh, good. One more problem. <laughs> 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 but you know, you know that. Because I already gave you everything about it. I gave you this equation. Where is it? Oh, I haven't. I haven't written it yet. I haven't written it yet. Yes, <laughs> I will give you basically all you need to calculate. Yeah. Yeah. But let, let me just say it so that there's no suspense. So we said that this is, we said that we're going to calculate uh, these, these coefficients, right? This is now true, right? J raises M. J plus raises m, j minus brings this down. And if I give you these coefficients, I've told you what how jx and jy act. Why? Think about the definition of j plus and j minus. So jx plus i j i. So if you want jx, you add j plus and j minus. So that cancels. If you want jy, you subtract. So maybe I won't give it to you. Oh, it was by construction. We, yeah, we, we could pick only one of them. Only one of them would commute with J squared. Call that JZ. Yeah. Whatever 
entirety of the protocol under that operation change the key? Because we have an intensive measure. So actually, maybe maybe this is not very clear so far, but what are what are J plus minus for for spin half? Can you do it in your head? We're running out of time, but all right. So what am I going to do next? I'm going to calculate for you those coefficients to give the answer to your question precisely. So uh, here are the matrix elements of J squared, right? They're pretty darn boring. J squared as an operator is what? In this in this 2j plus one dimensional Hilbert space, what is j squared as an operator? It's j times j plus one h bar squared identity. That's why it can be with everything. That delta j j prime, delta m prime m, that means identity. But it's more than identity. It's, it's identity in the J block. Actually, let me ah. <laughs> So what is the first value of J? Zero. Right? So what do you get over there? And M runs from uh, is one dimensional. So you end up with uh, zero here. This is the act something that acts on a one-dimensional Hilbert space. Then next, what do you have? You have a two-dimensional Hilbert space. It's proportional to identity, and the coefficient of it is half times half plus one g halves, the so three quarter of h bar squared. Uh, sorry. So here you have three over four h bar squared identity, which is two-dimensional. So this is wish three over four h bar squared, three over four h bar squared. What's the next one? It's three-dimensional. It's also diagonal. What's the coefficient? The coefficient is one times two times h bar. So this is h bar squared. This is 2h bar squared, 2h bar squared, 2h bar squared, right? So that's what the object is. I already said something weird or bizarre, but physically <laughs> bizarre. That's why I'm doing this, but oops. All right, is everybody following this? So I think, I think the punchline I will be, uh, done in the next lecture, but let me finish this calculation. Um, all right, JZ is also this, right? It's another diagonal matrix. To find the elements of matrix elements of J plus J minus, we're gonna take this object, J plus J plus tag. We saw that this is just J squared minus JZ squared minus H bar JZ. So if I look at the diagonal element of this, that will be, equal to this coefficient. But this diagonal element is nothing because J plus acting on J and M gives you C, J, M plus with one going up. So if J, M is, uh, is normalized properly, the proper norm, and this guy is properly normalized, C, J, M plus squared has to be this coefficient. It's just normalization. We, this is exactly how, in the case of uh, similar harmonic oscillator, we normalize the action of A plus and A minus. Do you remember how we normalized that? Is this analogous to that? So how did I normalize? I knew that A dagger acting on ket n will give me something times n plus one. How did I normalize this? How did I find this thing? I looked at the norm of this vector, right? The norm of this vector 
I notice that AA dagger is related to the number operator, for which case I knew it had to do with n, I could calculate it. From that, I could find this because by this equation, if this is coefficient c, this would be c squared. And I have an expression here. Right, right. Similarly, here, I want to fix this coefficient. I take the norm of this vector, and then I use my identities to calculate this norm. That's precisely what I'm doing. There are in the usually different ways of doing it. There's just one method applied to many examples. All right? This is just a bunch of addition and subtractions, and these are the answers you get. I, I, it's pretty straightforward to calculate. So um, fortunately, I, I ran out of time. But let me just say uh, this. So what are the, what is this, first of all? This is the. These are expressions for j plus j minus. By virtue of the, what I just told you, I, this also means that I give you, th these tell you what jx and jy are, right? So I gave you what jx is, what jy is, what jz is, in every representation of spin j, j as matrices. This is all that there is here. If you want to do a rotation, you basically take how do you do a rotation? You do jx times nx plus jy, and our rotation jy plus jz and z. Exponentiate this minus i this over h bar. Or if you're smarter, use the Euler angles that we will do next time. How would you do the Euler angles? An arbitrary rotation, you do exp minus i jz over h bar. Gamma, exp e to the minus i jy beta over h bar, exp minus i jz alpha over h bar. This is an arbitrary rotation. I need more matrices jz, jx, and j, jy as well. jx as well. All right. Good? All right, so I'm going to pause here for question and summarize because I didn't get to my punchline. Wow, I was ambitious. All right, any questions? What we did today was we said, imagine you have a Hilbert space that describes some physical system. We had to define the action of rotations on that Hilbert space. That's precisely what we did. Right? Something funny happened. We saw that, well, no, not really, it's not funny. We, we, we saw that, uh, well, the dimension of the Hilbert space is an integer. It could be always written as 2j plus 1. Every time the dimension of the Hilbert space was odd, the action of the rotations were where you expect. The kiss would come back where they were. Every time it was even by going around by 2 pi, you pick a minus sign. These were spinners. So if the dimension of the Hilbert space is 17, right? 17. No, sorry, 16. <laughs> You're dealing with what, what spinner? 15 over 2. Spin 15 over 2, right? But that's how uh, these matrices act. And we constructed precisely the action, all the matrix elements, right? Jx, Jy, and Jz. And then we said, now we rotation. You could do it your favorite way, but I suggest Euler angles because there are two Jz's that we wrote everything in the Jz basis. So it's diagonals. These are simple expressions. All right. Are there any questions? I'll finish my punchline next time. Not thank you. But let me let me just say one thing. In think about this before I make my punchline next time. It's, it's a very important statement. When I when we had the silver atom coming, 
lecture one, right? I was measuring something. Then I said, I rotate my thing and measure it. In all that description, I didn't never, I never needed to leave the two dimensional vector space. I could capture the whole thing by two dimensional complex vector space, right? That was crucial. A particle, spin of a particle is a property of it. It has to do with the dimensionality of the hyperspace space. 